And, and so at that point, Melissa put together um, these tank studies done down at CDFG in her facility. And so we took these 4,000 gallon um, saltwater tanks and filled them up with saltwater and put organisms in them. And so for a lot of the organisms, she just simply went down to the, the fish markets and got live, uh, live oysters, live Dungeness crabs. We put those in the tanks and then we got some water from Pinto Lake that had this blue-green algae in it and just dumped it into these big saltwater tanks as if it were river water flowing into the ocean and just watched over the next several days what happened. And we were uh, not surprised, but uh, not surprised that it happened, but pretty surprised at how quickly the levels of toxin went up in these organisms like uh, oysters and mussels and crabs. And that was really showing that you can get these toxins from this freshwater algae flowing into the ocean. The toxin, even though the algae themselves die, the toxin is there. It can be taken up by organisms living in the ocean. And then, of course, the otters are eating those. And so at that point, we had a pretty nice story where we could show that the otters were actually being exposed to these toxins, almost certainly because they were eating their normal food items and that those normal food items had picked up the toxin. What happens is from what I've read, excess nutrients going into a shallow, warm lake will provide ideal growing conditions for cyanobacteria. And that's what we've got here at Pinto Lake. We have a lot of phosphorus and a lot of nitrogen coming down from the watershed. And it sits in Pinto Lake during the summer months since Pinto does not flow out to Coralitas Creek and the Pajaro during most of the summer. And those provide ideal conditions for the cyanobacteria to grow. And that's why we end up with these heavy blooms of blue-green algae. And the reason it's called blue-green algae is because it's green and then when it forms drift on the side of the lake, it turns to this coppery blue color. It's actually quite pretty in a very sort of psychedelic way. So that's sort of the history of how I've got to here. Um, about three or four years ago, I was contacted by Melissa Miller, who's working on the sea otters, saying she'd heard I'd got cyanobacteria. Could we have a conversation? Turns out that she's found about 21 sea otters in the Monterey Bay area have died because of cyanotoxins and while Pinto Lake certainly isn't the only source of those toxins in this watershed, it's certainly the most well known now. The state requires that every time I become aware that the toxicity levels have exceeded five parts per billion, I place posters up here warning people not to go in the lake, not to swim, drink or in any way get in contact with the water. Five parts per billion for way to better understand that, think about there's a billion people in China. Think of 999,995 people in China wearing yellow hats and five people in China wearing red hats. That's how small the level is that I have to deal with. So just how toxic are cyanotoxins? Well, I think one of the best ways to frame it is to look at it in the context of other toxins that we're aware of. And I'd understood from research that's been done that some of the cyanotoxins are as lethal as cobra venom. So you get an idea of just what we're dealing with here. This isn't just some sort of, you know, under the, under the sink chemical that you have to be warned about not splashing on you. This stuff is seriously toxic. Another thing that you should be aware of is that these um, blooms are quite toxic to, can be toxic, for example, to your uh, pets, your dogs. So if you see really pea green water, don't let your animals swim in them. Certainly don't let your children swim in them and um, um, just be cautious. Not all pea green water is toxic, probably most of it is not, but um, I think it's um, a pr pretty easy uh, call when you see water that's um, not clear to just, just avoid it. So my experience with uh, cyanobacteria and problems with um, poisoning from that came from north coast rivers and I work for the Regional Water Quality Control Board on the north coast and they have all the rivers from the Bay Area to the Oregon border that drain to the ocean. Um, we ran into the problem first on the Klamath and we found that there was quite a little uh, problem with the upper Klamath due to the slowing down of the water in the dams in the upper reaches and uh, lots of uh, runoff from agricultural products. 
the lakes up there, uh, Lake Shastina, and the lakes behind the dams actually had quite a bit of uh, blue-green algae buildup. And as a result of that, there were poisonings of dogs that were actually confirmed. Uh, they had uh, swam in the water and licked the algae off of their fur, and they had been taken to uh, veterinary clinics in Oregon, and, because this is the upper part of the river, and they were confirmed to have been killed by cyanobacteria. Uh, this happened very quickly, which was a surprise because uh, not long after they licked their fur, they started to show signs of uh, being poisoned and they then uh, died and succumbed very quickly. The other places where there are problems are on the Eel River and the Van Dusen, which is a major tributary to the Eel several miles before it joins the ocean. That, that poisoning in there were also related to dogs who had uh, licked their fur after swimming. So there have been postings and there's a general uh, review of the streams just before warm weather comes, uh, just to make sure that we catch it before and put the warning signs out before there's a chance of poisonings. So these are some real major problems uh, with day-to-day -day activity with people in the, in the water with their animals. But the other uh, problem comes from the salmon uh, who are in the Klamath have a real uh, problem with many, many uh, diseases attacking them during warm water periods. And the cyanobacteria being a hemotoxin, uh, it goes for their, it's a blood toxin, it goes for the cells in their liver and when it, it can't pass through the liver, when it does it creates a blockage. So there's large um, lesions on the on the liver that are areas where the blood is blocked and can no longer flow. So it is one of the cumulative effects that is a real problem with salmon on the Klamath River at this time. So I, I, one of the questions I often get asked is what can I do about this? It seems such an overwhelming situation, an, incre an increasingly difficult problem to deal with at the regional level, highly toxic, what can anybody do? And I think the simple answer to that is you just have to do some very simple basic measures to reduce the amount of nutrients that are going in into receiving waters. So for the sake of Pinto Lake, I've got two primary watersheds here. Behind me is a residential area. They've got septic tanks. And the problem with septic tanks is unless you maintain them properly, they have the potential to discharge nutrients into the receiving waters. So one of the critical things is to make sure you get your pump, your tank pumped regularly and you have the leach fields checked so if you've got any problems with the leach fields saturated or not working you fix them. In terms of the other part of the watershed it's primarily in agriculture and so from an agricultural perspective we'd be looking at land use management, nutrient application, fertilizer application, erosion control, those sort of things. Simple straightforward stuff that you know, it just takes a little bit of time and thought to implement and you can make a significant change. So while you may not have Pinto Lake at the bottom of your watershed, you may have a pond or a stream section that actually has a cyanobacteria in it. You can make a difference. So the average person, you know, there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, uh, we're not everywhere. And so a, a big part of the problem is tracking down potential sources for these things. And so what really helps is just communicating with, with either us or with the water quality people about where these stagnant ponds are that are being overrun with these blue-green algae. And it's usually pretty obvious it's that, that bright green scum that's on the surface of the water. And oftentimes it's harmless, it's not actually producing toxins, but sometimes it is. And so various agencies can test for that. Um, here in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, the, um, there are county representatives that do the water quality testing. If it's in a park or recreational area, they can also do testing with these very fairly inexpensive rapid test kits. Things like being a little bit more careful about fertilizing your lawn, you know, not putting so much fertilizer on that it's simply running off into the storm drains. The long-term solutions are to, to let your congresspeople know, to let um, your local representatives know that you think uh, maintaining our environmental quality is really important. And so we do have laws on the book that talk about um, nutrient pollution, that talk about wastewater quality, 
and it's just a matter of making sure that that remains a priority for the agencies and, and for the people involved.